بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome to this podcast series of a commentary on Nahj al Balagha brought to you by Mizan Institute. Continuing with khutbah number one of Nahj al Balagha, Imam Ali he says, أول الدين معرفته وكمال معرفته التصديق به وكمال التصديق به توحيده وكمال توحيده الإخلاص له وكمال الإخلاص له نفي الصفات عنه. So we finish the first part of the first section of the first sermon of Nahj al Balagha. All right, so as I said before, sermon number one of Nahj al Balagha has different sections in it. The first section speaks of Allah and His attributes. And that first section that speaks of Allah and His attributes itself is divided into different parts. The first part we're done with. The second part here, Imam Ali begins speaking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how we're supposed to see Him, what the proper way to explain Tawheed is and understand Tawheed of Allah is, what the Ma'rifah of Allah means, and so on and so forth. And so he says, look, when you want to begin with deen and religion, awwalud deen, the first thing when it comes to religion is ma'rifatuhu, the ma'rifah of Allah, the cognition of Allah, understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what does that mean that if you're going to speak of religion, he is the first thing? Well, it means that this whole package of, let's say, Islam, which is a package comprising of beliefs, and duties, do's and don'ts, wajib and haram, everything, the whole package of religion, it will all rely on us first and foremost having an understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It all starts with Him and an understanding of Him, a recognition of Him, no matter how minute even. It doesn't say here, awwal ad-deen kamalu ma'rifatihi. Yes, it doesn't mean that, uh, it's not saying that if you want to have the right religion, the proper religion, it all begins with having total understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to say that even the smallest amount of ma'rifah towards Allah, the fact that even, even I have some understanding of Him, but it's a dubious one, let's say. It is one that is not full of conviction even. But there is a for me, there's a possibility within me, within my mind that, okay, He might be out there. Even that much is enough to spark something within me to go and research look into him see if i can if he does exist he does not exist that little bit of knowledge or ma'rifah of allah that has been put in us by means of the fitra the way allah has created us that nature that we have within us yes the way allah has created us fitra means the way we have been created this is a theological concept fitra one of the arguments for proving God's existence, which we don't want to get into right now, is the argument from fitra. Now, how strong or weak it is, according to different people, is going to be different. But all in all, what we know is that we will have a God-given uh, basic inclination towards a bigger, stronger, more powerful, more complete being than ourselves that we will probably call God. This is a fitri inclination. This itself is somewhat of an understanding of God. Now, however much we have ma'rifah of God, the minute amount, a, a more, more, a more or less, however much it's going to be, at the end of the day, the whole entire package of deen and religion is going to start with some understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it's one that is kind of dubious. But there is some ma'rifah there. That is the stepping stone. That is the starting point for everything else to come. Then the Imam goes on. He says, وَكَمَالُ مَعْرِفَتِهِ أَتَّصْدِيقُ بِهِ That if you want to have proper ma'rifah of him, a good indicator of that, a good sign of that, is that you have أَتَّصْدِيقُ بِهِ So what's going on here? You see, brothers and sisters, sometimes we have knowledge of something. We know it. But we haven't, let's say, embraced it yet. We haven't accepted all of the implications of that which we have knowledge of. Okay, So let's say somebody has reached the point where, and I do want to say this, by the way, before I go on, that there are different opinions on what is meant by this line here. I'll share with you maybe one or maximum two 
opinions in this regard. One opinion will hold that what is meant by this is that the peak of Ma'rifatullah, the most important aspect of Ma'rifatullah and understanding Allah is to have a tasdiqu bihi, to acknowledge Him Himself, Allah's existence it's himself, itself. In other words, if you want to make sure that you have proper ma'rifah of Allah, the first thing that you have to check is to make, see if you are sure that He even exists before anything else. So if you want to have the best ma'rifah of Allah, make sure that you have an acknowledgement of, of Allah's existence. That is one thing. Because God has different aspects, yeah? His power, His knowledge, all of these different aspects of God and attributes of God, correct? But the most important thing out of all of them is His existence itself. So that's the first thing that you need. It's the most important thing and very pivotal to the point where if you have that, you have kamal al-ma'rifah. That's one opinion in this regard. Another opinion says to have the highest amount of ma'rifah towards Allah it means that it doesn't mean that okay, I just know he's there. Because we lots of times have knowledge of things, but we don't give in to the implications of that. We are not consistent when it comes to the implications of that belief. For example, for example, many of us know that a dead body, a corpse, can't really do anything, correct? But yet knowing that this corpse that is next to me at nighttime, okay, we're it's getting a little spooky here. <laughs> Knowing that this corpse is next to me at night, if I'm all alone with it, I am more scared of that than probably a criminal that just got, a, got out of prison. You know, Although I know, I have knowledge, I have this information that a dead body can't do anything and is not going to do anything, yet I might be willing to spend the night with someone who's dangerous over, I, I might prefer that over spending the night with a dead body that I know can't hurt me, can't do anything to me. So here, some have said what is meant by kamalu ma'rifatihi at tasdiqu bih is kind of like this example, where yes, I have a certain knowledge that okay, a dead body can't do anything, but real knowledge of this matter equals me actually living up to whatever the implications of that will be. One of them being okay, then I should be cool with and okay with spending the night with this dead body, yeah not being too, too worried about it. And so this is a tasdiq bih. Tasdiq, literally, what it means is to consider something sadiq, to label it and see it as sadiq, as true. Okay? So when I believe, when I know that God exists, that's one thing. But to have submission to this and to all of its implications is, an, is another step to be taken. Just because I know something doesn't necessarily mean that I have faith in it or I believe in it or I have submitted to it. And so this is what some have said in regards to this line. So let's go back. It says, uh, Imam Ali, he says, din ma'rifatuhu. It starts with some form of ma'rifah of Allah and understanding of Allah. It starts from there. But if you want to make sure you have proper ma'rifah of Him, you, it has to be accompanied with a tasdiq. And this is something that Allama Tawatabai he talks about in uh, Tafsir of Al-Mizan when he's explaining what faith really is, what Iman really is. He says, faith in God isn't just that a person knows that God is the truth, God exists, you know? It's more than that. Why? Because just knowing and understanding does not will not equal faith and will not be accompanied with faith. It can also be accompanied with istikbar and inkar, denial, rejection. When I know something, yes, sometimes I will, ha I will have faith. Sometimes I will disbelieve in it in the sense that I will reject it, although I know it's truth. And verses of the Quran speak about this. وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا And Fusuhum, the Quran says that there were some people, they rejected the signs of God, although they had yaqeen and conviction in them. Okay, so Allama Tawatabai is pointing something out here. He says, look, just knowing something doesn't mean that it's going to always be accompanied with faith because it can sometimes be accompanied with denial and rejection. And I think he makes a very nice point here. And so then he goes on. He says, and since we know that faith and denial, these two don't get along with each other, 
Yes, we can become sure that just knowing is not going to be enough for actual iman, actual faith. Iman is more than that. What is it? What what else does it come with then? Knowledge and ma'rifah, yes, but what else does it come with? Oh, Allah Tabatabai. He says it comes with an embracing, an acceptance from the soul itself, from the person themselves, in regards to that which they have understood now. I worded it like this. I said, uh, living up to the implications of that belief that they have, of that information that they have. They know God exists. Now they live up to that knowledge, which is what? Which is submitting, which is embracing, which is accepting. Yeah, And so, in one word, I would just say submission. All right, so the Imam goes on now. He says, وَكَمَالُ التَّسْدِيقِ بِهِ تَوْحِيدُهُ To make sure now that I have the highest level of acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, proper understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I want to know if I got that I got it right, tawheeduhu is the tawheed of Allah, to have the tawheed of Allah, to do the tawheed of Allah. That's the better way of saying it, brothers and sisters. Tawheed it, uh, it's, is the infinitive of wahada yuwahidu. It's an Arabic verb which means to make something one, to unite something, to see it as one, however you like to say it. And so he says, if you want to make sure you've got it right so far, it'll all be summed up in one word, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course this means to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as one in everything, in every aspect, especially of course his essence. But it's not, it's not limited to that. And there are different types of tawheed, tawheed af'ali, tawheed dhati, tawheed sifati. These are different types of tawheed we don't want to get into. These have been discussed in uh, conventional theology books. That when it comes to Allah and the tawheed and oneness of God, it's not when we say tawheed of Allah, it doesn't just mean the oneness of God in His essence. It's more than that, in everything. In, in matters of even uh, legislating law, He is the sole authority. And the one who makes decisions for the use of, for the universe, he is the sole authority. Now, sometimes he will make decisions based on the way we exercise our will. But in the end, he's at the top of the chain of causes and effects, and so on and so forth. These are theological discussions that we don't want to get into right now. So if you want to have the proper ma'rifah of him, it is to have proper tasdiq of him. And then here it says proper tasdiq of him means to have the tawheed, the proper Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have more than one God, for example, then you've got it all wrong. You can tell that your ma'rifah of him is wrong, your tasdiq of him is going to, as a result, also be wrong, and so on and so forth. Okay, so everything is going to really revolve around tawheed. But how do I know if I got the tawheed of Allah right? Do I just say, okay, God is one, that's it, and we're good? Do I say, God is the all-powerful, the almighty, the all-seeing, the all-knowing, the all-hearing? Right? He's the one, he's the one, he's at the top. Is that how it is? How do I make sure that I've gotten his tawheed right? The khutbah goes on to say, وَكَمَالُ تَوْحِيدِهِ الْإِخْلَاصُ له. That the peak of his tawheed, in other words, to make sure that you got his tawheed right, you see him as one in the right way. Because right here someone might say, oh, so we can see him as one in the wrong way? Well, we'll talk about that, yes. To make sure that you are seeing him as one in the right way, we need to discuss what this line will mean. Al-ikhlasu lah. You have to have you have to have ikhlas. Now, upon hearing this, the first thing that comes to our mind is that okay, that means that if we're gonna do anything, we need to do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I still remember uh, you know growing up, whenever I would see this line, that's the first meaning that would come to my mind. Al-ikhlasu lahu. For those who know Arabic grammar. Um, this lam al ikhlasu lahu, you know, usually what we'll take it at is lamul milkiya, but turns out it's not necessarily the case. Okay, al ikhlasu lahu. Let's talk about this a little bit. There are three ways one can have ikhlas. They say number one, al ikhlas al amali, practical ikhlas. What does that mean? That means that I will only worship Allah subhanahu wa taala. And I will only do things for him. Worshipping him is only for him. No riya involved, no showing off involved, no, no other intentions involved. Okay, This is ikhlas. Ikhlas here means to purify. What are you purifying when it comes to al-ikhlas al-amali? Practical ikhlas. What are you purifying? 
you're purifying your intention, your action from everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're doing it qurbatan ila Allah, to get close to Allah and Allah alone. Okay. Another form of ikhlas or example of ikhlas is where they call it al-ikhlas al-qalbi. Ikhlas that has to do with the heart. And what they mean by that isn't like intentions before for my worship and all of that. No, it has to do with the fact that I have nothing in my heart except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My heart only pays attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this will be one grade higher, one degree higher than practical ikhlas. Sometimes I have others in my heart, but yet I'm careful when I do worship of Allah, I do it only for Him. That's one thing, okay? To, to make sure that my worship is for Allah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that no one else is in my heart either. I might have attention, I, I might my heart might be having attention towards others as well and giving attention to others as well, caring about others as well. But there are some people who have gone up that ladder of spirituality to the point where only Allah is in their hearts. If anyone else, they like anybody else, it's because Allah wants them to love that individual as well. But in the end, Allah is at the top. Allah has taken all of the room their person, so to speak, has in their heart. Okay, this is al-ikhlas al-qalbi. And so what's for sure is if a person has ikhlas qalbi, they're going to they're gonna have ikhlas amali as well, right? You can't, you can't uh, only have Allah in your heart, but then when it comes to your actions, not do them for Allah. But yeah, a person who has practical ikhlas doesn't necessarily always have qalbi ikhlas. So one will pl- apply to the other, but not vice versa. One more time, I'll say this very quickly. If you have ikhlas qalbi, according to the definitions that were given, if you have ikhlas qalbi, you will definitely have ikhlas amali. But it's not the case that if you have ikhlas amali, always you, that means that you are one of those who has ikhlas qalbi as well. All right, so hopefully that's clear. But then there's a third ikhlas that they talk about as well that has nothing to do with the heart, has nothing to do with the actions and making sure those are pure and are only done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is al-ikhlas al-i'tiqadi, which is a total different genre. What is it referring to? It's referring to ikhlas when it comes to belief and how I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means to remove from Allah any form of deficiency, any form of need. If the way I look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, entails any deficiency in him, any need in him, then that is wrong. And I will make sure that I purify my belief, my perspective of Allah, of that deficiency. Okay, let's look at the... So we have three types of ikhlas here. Which one fits the context? Well, the context we're in, in this part of the khutbah, is a context of speaking of God and the way God is in theory his attributes, how we're supposed to see him, and so on and so forth. And so this, in my opinion, very humble opinion, and of course commentators of Nahj al have also said this, this will disprove and put aside the first two forms of ikhlas that were mentioned. Al-ikhlas al-amali, al-ikhlas al-qalbi, that's not what is meant here, they say. What is meant here by al-ikhlas ulah? When the imam says, وَكَمَالُ تَوْحِيدِهِ الْإِخْلَاسُ لَهِ If you want to make sure you got it right when it comes to his tawheed and his oneness, is to make sure that you have ikhlas towards him, they'll say what is meant is that you have to make sure that you are not ascribing any deficiency and need to him. In other words, you have to make sure whatever you ascribe to him of attributes, is, is, is pure of any form of deficiency. This understanding of this line is supported by the following line especially. What does the following line say? وَكَمَالُ الْإِخْلَاصِ لَهُ نَفْيُ الصِّفَاتِ عَنْهُ And if you want to make sure that you got it right when it comes to attributing qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are pure and devoid of any deficiency whatsoever, if you want to make sure you got that right, what do you do? نَفْيُ sifati anhu. You have to negate and take away 
and deny and not ascribe any sifat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wow. So let's see what's going on here. Are you saying that I'm not allowed to say Allah is almighty? Allah is all-seeing, all-knowing, all-hearing, all-powerful. I can't say that because it's saying nafyu sifati an nafi means to deny something, to strip something of something, to repel something from something else, to not let something happen in regards to something else. Nafyu sifat, sifat. We all know what sifat means. It's an, it's a it's a word used in Farsi, used in Urdu, Arabic, of course. Yeah, sifat is the plural of sifa, which means what? It's a, a sifa is an attribute, is a word that is used to describe something else, an adjective sometimes. Okay? It says that to make sure that you have purified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to your understanding of Him, al ikhlasu lahu, which makes that lam, once again, for those who might know Arabic grammar, that lam become, is called lam al taqwiyah. Because al-ikhlas is a mastar, the lam comes and uh, strengthens it in its amal, in its ma'mul. Okay, so that's just some technical stuff I said. Okay, it's not important. This kamal this uh, al-ikhlas kamal al-ikhlasi lahu, to make sure that I have purified him in my th- in theory, in my understanding of him. It is to it, how do I do that to make sure that I don't attribute any attributes to him? Whoa, whoa, what's going on here now? Because the Quran even does that. The Quran even gives attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does it mean when it's saying this? And so here the commentators of Nahj al-Balagha, they explain. They say, look, don't get too worried here. What is meant by, and there might be some other opinions on this as well, but as I've said before, our point in the in this podcast series is to try to understand the surface meaning of the text. But yeah, like this part of Nahj al-Balagha, you can spend maybe 10 lectures on it, you know? Uh, but we don't want to do that. We want to cover as much area as we can and just get rid of as much ambiguity as we can from the text. Okay, so they will say that, look, when it says, we need you to, or Imam Ali says, I need you to not ascribe any qualities and attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qualities and attributes or sifat, they're of two types. And when the Imam is you, when he says, I don't want you attributing any qualities to Allah, what kind of qualities is he talking about? He's talking, this is what they'll say. They'll say that the qualities he's speaking of are those qualities that we are accustomed to. The con- conventional qualities that we see for other beings and creation of God, not just God. And so this is where they will say the sifat qualities are of two types. Qualities and attributes are those that belong to the creation of God as well, like makhluqat, other makhluqat, or cre- creatures of God. And there are some that are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are the attributes of the wajibul wujud, they call it. The necessary being, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. What is the difference between these two sets of qualities? Well, the qualities that the creatures of God have, they will say that, and philosophers will say this, those are attributes that can be there for the creatures of God and can not be there. They are not part of the essence of the creature or, creature or the creation of God. They do not make up that thing. They are not part of its whatness and mahiya, as they call it. So for example, for example, human being. The human being is a creature of God, is a creation of God. When we want to define the human being, we want to see what makes the human being a human being. We want to break down the essence and the mahiya, they say, of the human being. When we do that, anywhere, do we find anywhere in its definition having a certain amount of knowledge, ilm? Do Do we find that anywhere in any dictionary? Yes, there might be in its definition the potential to gain knowledge, but does it necessarily mean knowledge has to be there or else you're not a human being? Well, what if when, what, what about babies when they're born? Right? What, if, what about people who forget everything at the end of their life? What about someone who never studies anything? Knowledge and ilm is not, although it will usually accompany the human being and be there with the human being, but it is not part of the human being's essence, brothers and sisters. And so this is one of those qualities, 
Yes, one of those qualities that we have in the creatures of God, in the creation of God. Ilm. And many other. Quwa and Qudra. Power. Okay, just because someone's weak, that means they're not a human being anymore? No. Yes, every person will have an extent of power, but that doesn't mean that power now is part of the definition of the human being. Part of the essence of a human being. When we want to break down and, and come up with an essence so that we can identify all of the human beings out there. Doesn't necessarily mean power is part of it. Okay, so these qualities of power and knowledge, when they come with the creation of God, they can be there, they can not be there. This type of knowledge that is not essential to the human being, for example, this is the not when we say knowledge, this is the sifa of knowledge, the attribute of knowledge that we as human beings are accustomed to. Then you have another knowledge. That is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Knowledge of Allah is not something that you can take away from His essence. In other words, it is part of the definition of God to have knowledge. As a matter of fact, it's uh, philosophically, philosophically they'll say that it's even wrong to say God has knowledge. No, God is knowledge. The essence of God is all knowledge. While it is also all power, it is all this, it is all that. So we say Allah has ilm, we say uh, we have ilm. But brothers and sisters, there is a big difference between these two. One of them is the attribute and quality of the creation. One is the quality and attribute of God and the wajib al-wujud, the necess necessary being. True, these two share the same term that refers to them. They share the same word, which is ilm, which is knowledge, but they are essentially very different. All right, so now, having said that, if we have two types of sifat, though we have the sifat that have to do with the makhluqin, the creation of God, and then we have sifat that have to do with God himself, the commentators of Nahj al have said that when we say Allah to have the proper understanding of God, which is pure of all deficiency, if we want to have such a proper understanding, it is to strip God of all of those sifat. What is meant by sifat here is the normal conventional sifat that we are used to. What comes to mind when I say he's a knowledgeable person, she's a knowledgeable individual? What does that mean? That means they have X amount of knowledge, but of course there will be X amount of Lack of knowledge as well in that person. The knowledge that I see in someone can be accompanied with ignorance as well. Knowledge of some things and ignorance of others. No one can claim to have 100% knowledge of everything. And so whenever I use the word knowledge, subconsciously even, I might not even be paying attention to this, but I know that knowledge, although is something that is positive, but it will have a deficiency as well, a lack of knowledge that it will also have. So everything is going to become relative as if when it comes to these qualities of the creation of God. It's as if Imam Ali is saying, I want you to get rid of this understanding. When you attribute knowledge to God, I, I don't attribute knowledge to God, the knowledge that you attribute to others. If you say God is one, yeah, we were talking about proper tawheed of Allah in every aspect. When you say God is one, is it like the same way I say, this pen is one pen? This book is one book? No, there can always be another book just like this one. There can always be a pen just like this one. There can always be another person like this one. It's not something impossible, even if it never happens. You know, they, they say, no two people's fingerprints are the same. True. But is it philosophically impossible for two people to have the same f f fingerprints? No. It just never happens. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say Allah is one, the oneness that we are supposed to ascribe to him is different than the oneness that I ascribe to this pen or that book. The oneness of Allah means that it's impossible for there to be another one like him. Impossible. He cannot be duplicated. So the Imam here, according to the commentators of Nahj al-Balagha, and of course, as I said, I'm keeping it as simple as I can, although it might have gotten a little technical, the commentators say that when Imam Ali says, it is to do nafyu sifati anhu, to take away qualities from God. Someone might say, but the Quran says this, the Quran says that. That's true. So what is meant by, by what Imam Ali says here is that when you say 
oh, Allah is one, Allah has knowledge. I don't want you to say that. Because what you probably have in mind is the one, the same oneness that you ascribe to a pen. Or the same knowledge that you ascribe to an individual, you're ascribing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, at a higher level, but still, that will be accompanied with deficiency. Therefore, whatever of these qualities that I attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reality, because they come with deficiency, it's as if I am attributing deficiency to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I am attributing deficiency to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indirectly that means that I have not had a pure, mukhlas or mukhlis understanding of Allah. I don't have that ikhlas, the proper ikhlas of Allah, which is to have a pure understanding of Him. Yes, there will be one exception to this whole rule though. The Quran says, Subhanallah amma yasifun illa ibadallah al There are some individuals that are the chosen ones, the purified ones that Allah has purified when they speak of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they attribute sifat, yasifun, when they attribute sifat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they actually know what they're talking about. They will not, they, they will be careful because of that high faith that they have, because of that special knowledge maybe Allah has given him, because of that purification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they are speaking of Allah, they know what they're talking about. If they say God is one, if they say God has knowledge and all these things, they have experienced what that really means. They know what that means. They have tasted it really. Yes, it's not that, oh, I have to be a philosopher necessarily. No, they might not even be philosophers. But these are like the prophets of God. These are the imams of, 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 the, of Ahlul Bayt, for example, alayhim salatu wasalam, and so on and so forth. And so these people, the Qur'an says, there are going to be some who will know what they're talking about. Subhanallah amma yasifun illa ibadallah al These are verses 159 and 160 of Surah Al-Safat. And this, of course, line has been mentioned other places as well. But this, the, part, the interesting part about this one is that an exception is made, that there are some people. Subhanallah amma yasifun. Allah is so much higher than what these people think of Him. But there is one exception to this, and he is the way that they think of him. Who? Ibadullahil Mukhlasin, the chosen, purified servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How did they get there? Through philosophy? Not necessarily. Philosophy is cool, philosophy is good, philosophy does give us a very good understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to really make sure you got it right, you have to be a proper servant of Allah, obedient servant of Allah to the point that Allah purifies you, Mukhlasun. Allah purifies you. Once you're purified, inshallah, inshallah, your understanding of Allah is also purified. And that's when you have kamalul ikhlasi lahu and you have nafyu sifati anhu. Later on in this same khutbah, Imam Ali, he uh, talks about the angels. And over there, he also says the same thing that he's saying here. He says that the angels la yujruna alayhi sifati al masnu'een, that the angels will not ascribe and apply the qualities of the masnu'een. Masnu'een means the, the created things, creation. They will never attribute the qualities of the creation to their Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in other words, these ibadullah al chosen servants of God, who understand what Allah is all about, they have reached the point where they're like the angels. The same way the angels don't make this mistake, these individuals who are ibadullah al also don't make this mistake. Okay, so this is kamalul ikhlasi lahu nafyu sifati anhu. The Imam continues, um, and we will inshallah cover this in our next episode, but the Imam continues. He points out the problem with ascribing qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We looked at it from one angle that there's going to always be deficiency accompanying those qualities that we attribute to Allah. But then he will go on and also point out some of the other ramifications of ascribing qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll leave that inshallah for our next episode. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.